All right. Uh, good evening, everybody. This is Ken, the Tortoise Capital, with uh, uh, Advanced Swing Workshop follow-up number two. It is September 5th, 2016. Happy birthday to me. Um, there were only uh, three questions uh, to uh, address, so I'm going to start off uh, with those, and then uh, I'm going to transition into a review of the um, weekend report with an eye towards uh, picking some swing trade uh, uh, targets. Uh, and then uh, we'll take a look at them on the chart to see if we can uh, see the different kinds of uh, candidates we might get into with some of the advanced techniques. So um, without any further ado, um, let's see. Uh, Willie uh, had asked this question. On one of the trades, I've indicated three entry and three exit points, indicating the zone in which I could enter and exit. And when entering late and exiting late, the profit in the trade has gone. Uh, his understanding is that this illustrates that when making a mistake in the entry or the exit, the potential profit uh, can rapidly disappear and makes him aware that everything needs to be accurate. Um, could I comment on that during the course um, if it is appropriate? I would say yes. And so let me let me try to uh, size this up a little bit. All right. So um, let's see if I can get my highlighter. So uh, entry number one, uh, he has at this level, uh, right in here, and you can see that that's right after an RLCO, and we have a one, two, three entry uh, right at entry one. And so that creates a uh, what he has labeled as the earliest acceptable entry, and I agree with that. Uh, that's right at the moment of RLCO. I, um, anything earlier than that is really speculative. Now, some of the things that we can see on that is that we've got an unambiguous move. Now, in terms of an owl, we have an unambiguous move down. We have the 10 has reversed, but the 30 doesn't, uh, doesn't start rolling up until this level over here. All right, so the earliest possible moment is in this area. And I like what he's got here as he's framed out the time frame uh, for an entry period. So this is a good understanding uh, of the time dimension here. So entry level one, I take that as the earliest acceptable. Uh, he's looking at a uh, stop loss level down here at the uh, below the swing low in the RL10 or at this very swing low of the move. And it also happens to be at um, uh, just above the Z minus 2. I would also accept a, an entry down in here at Z minus 2. And then entry level 2, um, I take is right here. And this is where I think he's... Um, maybe where the uh, RL10 has crossed the dragon. So we have an RLXD right about here. And so you could get uh, some kind of entry in this period, in this time frame right there. I accept that one as sort of the middle, uh, the middle uh, time period entry. And then entry number three uh, is happening over here uh, somewhere in this zone. And I would see that as, as an owl entry because now you have the 30 rolling up, or it could even be after this little pocket entry in here. So I would accept entry one, two, and three, uh, as Willie has described it. I think those are, those are fair statements or fair examples um, of where those entries could be. So entry one, maybe entry two, and I think somewhere in here, entry could be anywhere in this, in this region, entry three. Because depending on where you are, 
um, you could get any of those entries in that region. And then the three levels that he has uh, indicated for uh, exiting, uh, level one, oh, let me pull that over a little bit. Okay, so the first exit that he's looking at really is here. I would take that as the as a one, two, three exit. That one is legit, right at the bottom of that second bar down. I accept that as a level one exit. Um, level two, when you get the RLXD leaving, the, so the ten has left the uh, left the dragon. So you're getting a two there. And then the third exit somewhere in this region uh, where you are waiting for the owl exit as the not later than exit. That gets you this timeline here. And his point is well made that if you were if you got the latest possible entry and then stuck around for the latest possible exit, in fact you could you could actually have a negative uh, result on this trade. Of course if you got uh, entry one and entry two, or entry two, uh, you would have still had a positive trade, uh, but it's clear that you've left behind uh, quite a large amount of the actual gain. And so, uh, I agree with this point that if you get the uh, the early earliest reasonable entry, and then the earliest reasonable exit, you're on the front side of that of that battle, and you get you get quite a nice trade uh, out of that. So you would get uh, approximately this exit on this entry. And then against this against this stop loss, if that would be your risk. And so that looks like you would get about a one, possibly a two R gain uh, if that's if that's your one R. So yeah. Depending on the, on your timing, you could turn what is a reasonable two R opportunity into a slightly fractional loss. The other thing I would just observe is that you've gone this trade moves from minus two to plus two in uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven time periods. And so when the move starts to decay, if you've got a minus two to a plus two move, uh, the next expected move is at least back down to the, uh, to the Bollinger Band mean, which is half the distance, right? So one, two, a move back to the Bollinger Band mean leaves you only one R if or less, and that's if you had entered right at the bottom of the channel. Uh, so, yeah, his uh, uh, Willie's questions are well made, and uh, I think it's a pretty clear example of a very normal type case that if you can, uh, I notice now that the baby dragon is rolling up, the RL10 is crossed and entering in the dragon, and you get an RLXD. Those, I think, those are reasonable places to enter. And if it fails, like if it doesn't even get to the Bollinger Band mean, if it fails anywhere in here, now the place where you have your stop loss is is your stop, and that's your not later than entry on the south side. But if instead you actually get a move from minus 2 to plus 2, how much more did you think there was going to be? I really look at that as a way to uh, cash at exit 1, and then look for resumptions of this trade anywhere north of the Bollinger Band mean. And then what you've done is you've protected against those sell-offs uh, in a nice way. Okay, So that's what I want to say about Willie's case study. And I will tell you, if you have some other, if you guys have case studies that are similar where you want to uh, confirm your understanding of the different ideas, uh, if you put them on a chart and send them to me, I'll include them in, that, in the third um, follow-up 
webinar as well. Um, those should always be handy. And then at, at, at any time, if you have questions even beyond that time frame and you uh, post them in the uh, chat room, uh, I generally am able to answer those pretty quickly. So I encourage you to take advantage of the opportunity. Okay. If there's no questions on that one, I'm going to move on to the, um, to the other questions. Okay, so Susan asked, uh, in the class I said that the channeling system works well for indexes. Is it reliable for stocks as well? I would say uh, provisionally, yes. It tests out pretty well. There's more volatility in the results that you get with stocks than you do get with ETFs. The gaps are larger. Uh, the moves are more volatile with stocks, and so you have to I believe, add a little more management to the uh, trade frames. And then I think things like uh, support and resistance levels are more important. They're certainly important for indexes, don't get me wrong, but I just think that support and resistance levels are even more important for individual stock symbols. And so what you want to look for in the uh, channeling system then are symbols that have a greater uh, propensity for swing type movements. And by that I mean, uh, do they have the long uh, enduring moves from support and resistance that are the characteristic of ETFs? In other words, is it a stock that behaves like an ETF or an index? One of the ways that you can check that real quick is to use the Renko chart and then see how, uh, I'm going to use the word swingy, how swingy does it look? Does it have typical moves of five or six Renko boxes or is it got choppy moves? The more it looks like it has uh, Renko moves of, you know, six or seven bars, the easier it is for you to see a potential swing trade unfold that uses two Renko boxes as, a, as an initial stop. So my answer is yes on that. And one of the reasons I look at the Dow 30 in addition to the ETF 30, both of those are larger than um, the original set for the channeling. The channeling and overreaction we've exhaustively tested on the big 10 or 11 uh, broad ETFs, and I'm satisfied that they work uh, well on those broad ETFs. Uh, but I also look at them as trade frames for the Dow 30 and the ETF 30 uh, just because it's been reliable enough to do it. And in that case, I am more likely to manage that on a day-to-day -day basis and grab the gains when I can get them as opposed to waiting for an orderly pullback that gets me out. I'm more inclined to take the earlier exit and that was a technique that I used in the um, uh, in the live portfolio uh, management dur during the advanced swing course. So if you go through those uh, videos, um, you'll notice that I uh, uh, am relatively quick to capture gains in individual stocks, uh, especially nowadays with as volatile as things can be, that when I get an outsized gain, I'm much more inclined to just take it and then stock for new targets rather than worrying about trying to stay in the position too long. Okay? All right, Susan, if, that, if you need to hear more, just let me know, but that's my basic answer. I would start with the large caps first and then uh, expand outward from there. I, but first of all, I would actually say I would use the broader set of indexes first and then move to the... Um, uh, to the Dow 30. You know that most of the Dow 30 stocks because they're globals and they take into account currencies and they have different lines of operation in some sense they are like uh, broad ETFs themselves and they start behaving more like uh, a, broad, a collection of businesses under a single ticker than an individual narrowly 
to find stock. The further away from the Dow 30 you go, the less that that is true. So I would start with the broader set of ETF 30 and then go to the uh, uh, Dow 30. Um, and then I would also check them against the Renko charts in order to see um, how, how uh, swing friendly they are, if I can say it that way. Put a note there to look at when we get to the charts to look at Renko. Okay. Um, the second question was in timing for a swing, some of the mechanical systems work well in bear and sideways markets. Uh, triple screen washout, 5DDs are in, working well in bear. 551W can work nice and sideways. Do I recommend timing these to trade only when the risk Z and the RL30 are rising? I think so. Uh, with the following provision, in the bull market, I think you can trade those symbols without uh, necessarily looking at the RL30 or the risk C. The fact that we're in a bull market would uh, makes it favorable. But as soon as you get into sideways and bear, then I like to see the risk C going in my favor and certainly the RL30 going in my favor in order to get in on the long side. Now I would also say that in a bear uh, market, the failure signals on those uh, on those systems also can work very well because now you're trading in the direction of the expected failure and now this thing instead of becoming a counter trend trade is now failing in the same direction that the broader market is going and then you can I think pounce on those uh, and get some really nice one and two day trades so yeah uh, generally speaking in bear and Sideways, I want to see the risk Z uh, and or the RL30 to be favorable. But I would also look at those as opportunities to, when they fail, to be open to a swing trade to the downside on those. Uh, Tom asked, uh, the U.S. equity market overall has been trading in a very narrow range in the past 30 or so days. Uh, what are the strategic adjustments, if any, do I suggest for swing trading? Uh, such as maybe position sizing, the numbers of new trades, um, the uh, target selection or market selection or time frames. Generally speaking, what I would say in a sideways choppy kind of market or even sideways quiet. Now, uh, the market moved sharply about 30 days ago, up 5 or 6%, and leveled off at the current prices where it's been abnormally narrow for almost 30 days now. It's a, almost a, a historically narrow range and it looks like a sideways quiet channel uh, when you look at the chart pattern. It's In my market classification scheme it's a bull because we're still above the 200 day moving average. But certainly there has been no uh, favorable moves in the last 30 days. Um, so you would not be wrong in describing that really as a sideways market in a shorter time frame. So uh, what I would say on that is in terms of position sizing, uh, I don't think it's crazy to use a smaller percentage of the portfolio to risk per trade in sideways markets. Um, and that way you wait to see a successful trade and then use markets money to scale as opposed to using the same amount of risk when you have a directional market. I think it, it only makes sense to me that when you have a sideways market that you can have a smaller initial position at risk because it's more of a toss-up about whether or not that signal is favorable. And the amount of follow-through is, is less as well. So I, I think a smaller position sizing is sound. Uh, as far as the number of new trades, I would probably say in terms of portfolio heat that in sideways markets uh, you could afford to have uh, you know half as much portfolio heat. I would think about going that far if, for the same reason that you're reducing position sizing. Uh, and that is that the, um, the moves out of a sideways narrow range uh, tend to get everybody moving in the same direction on the basis of broad indexes and futures and options and so um, 
those things move first and then the whole market moves in that direction. So my spider sense says that there's a stronger correlation uh, of moves inside uh, the sideways markets. And so that's why I think you could afford to limit the number of new trades and reduce portfolio heat. Uh, in terms of securities and market selection, uh, I would still want to look for relative strength and try to concentrate on going long on the things that have relative strength over their other peers or have relative weakness if, if I was going short. So I have been looking a lot at Brazil lately because even though the U.S. elections have been uh, causing, I think, the market to be sideways and ne very narrow while we're waiting to see what happens in the silly season, Brazil, on the other hand, has been uh, more directional, uh, as have metals and mining and uh, some of the commodities. And so uh, I certainly take, I try to narrow my scope then to those broad indexes uh, that are um, uh, trendier than uh, than the broad market itself. So I think those are all the things. Those are some things that you can do um, in that sideways chop. I think you can also be more prepared for stop and reverse, or using the equivalent of that Z3PO or Z3PC type of a trade, uh, in order to respond to the channeling type conditions. Um, so, uh, Tom, I see you on. Does that uh, does that sort of answer your question? I'm going to take that as a yes. Oh, okay, thanks. Hey, let me take about a five-minute break. My brother's calling me for my birthday. I'd like to let you get a chance to uh, get a drink, and then I want to get into the um, um, uh, report review and take a look at some swing candidates. So give me about five minutes here, and then I'll be right back. I'll give you a chance to get a, to get a refreshment. Thanks. Hey, thanks, Susan. Uh, okay, I'm back a little bit quicker than I thought, so uh, we'll just go ahead and get started. Um, uh, I'm just going to go through the weekend report and then try to pick out some swing patterns here. Uh, I noticed that we are in, um, uh, we're still in bullish quiet, so that favors the long side. So long side breakouts are still a good thing. Uh, we are approaching the high end of normal here, almost overbought on an annual basis. And then at the upper end of normal on the short-term 10-day NDX. 
those are all favorable. Uh, to long side swings, price relative to the 200 day moving average, green bullish is good, the slope of the 50 at white bullish, that's a good thing. Um, the market is non-trending, however, uh, last week uh, ADX was under 15 and now has come back above 15, uh, so it's now at 16, so that's normally been uh, a thing to notice to see if the bulls or the bears are in charge on the slowly improving ADX. Uh, and then to say that that is possibly the direction of the new trend. Um, the risk index remains uh, below 1.0 at 0.956, so we're still in risk off. This is a cautionary tale right here, which says, look, the market is very vulnerable to these downside moves. And so what that, what that has me do is... Uh, now we're getting conflicting signals between the bullishness and then the volatility, volatility condition. So what that tells me is basically the same uh, way I answered Tom's question, uh, that I'm reducing my position size, taking fewer signals, uh, more likely to take short-term profits when I can. And so that actually has me more of an intraday trader than a swing trader until this, this – uh, this dichotomy is, is changed. Um, I, we just did the uh, blended monthly rebalancing. So the things that are working, you'll notice, is Brazil and Latin America, emerging markets, also another emerging markets, and then the U.S. small caps, IWM. So those are all speculative traders' vehicles that are uh, away from the S&P, uh, which is the big money. So this tells me is that guys that are making money are trading on the fringes because I think people are waiting to see what the U.S. market is going to do based on which way the presidential election goes. This is going to be an, an election unlike we've seen since, I mean, who knows when. Um, these When you have two candidates that are more hated by the other side than ever before with little to no room for compromise uh, and the race being so close, um, the implications for business and the markets are so extreme that it doesn't surprise me to see the market just uh, marking time in one spot uh, until we get some clarity. And so that says to me that I'm not surprised to see uh, the uh, overseas markets, emerging markets, Latin America, Brazil, being the ones that are dominating. And even inside the U.S., uh, the small caps where traders are um, – um, are more tactical than position traders. That doesn't surprise me at all. So I'm going to keep that in mind as we, as we go forward. Um, really not much to choose from inside here, inside these blended monthly rebalancings. Um, I will say, let me zoom in on this one a little bit. Uh, one of the things I like to do is look for anomalous behavior. So things like uh, just uh, silver and gold. Um, on a three-month and a six-month basis, you can see those things are solidly in the green. They've made great recoveries, but they are all been beaten down for the last month. But then you notice that gold has come back to the top in the short term. And so in one way, what that is looking like, if I were to draw this as a relative strength, Gold seems to be making um, this kind of a statement. Uh, been very, very strong, pulled back over the last month, and then in the last week has made a, a nice move. And that pattern looks to me like a homemade uh, triple screen or buy on dips. So if we were to say that was a support level and here's an opportunity um, and we go back just to the 30-day high or something like that, then what we would be looking for is capturing this move uh, against this much risk. And then with the possibility of if it breaks through to a new high, then adding a, a second position. So when we look at GLD, that's going to be the pattern that I'm looking for um, for support resistance and for trade framing. So we will take a look at uh, gold. Uh, in that 
in that sense. Okay. Uh, does anybody not see how I came to those conclusions? And that really just comes from looking at these at these top looking at these top symbols that are uh, exceptional on three and six months. I see the one month anomaly, and then I see gold doing really well in the green. This green red green looks very promising. In another sense, coal looks like that too, with green yellow and green. That hasn't even been beaten down as much as the others. On the other hand, I look at something like metals and mining, XME, and I see that thing is red and red and green. So it has not even turned the corner yet. In fact, it's still suffering. So gold looks to be, to me, to be the interesting anomaly that in the metals and mining sector, gold is recovering, whereas metals and mining and palladium are failing. Uh, I might look at these here in social media in India and say, you know what, here, what's, what's not to love about greens all the way across the board? Uh, so SCIN would be something I would, uh, I'd be interested in, SCIN. Uh, this green, red, green pattern is happening here as well with silver. With USV, but we've already got that with SLV, so we're okay. Um, yeah, silver uh, all over the place, green, red, green. Here's another India fund that is greens all the way across the board. So here's a couple things that we could look at then, is we might say, let me look at XME and Palladium as ways to capitalize on the failure. And so um, here's the pattern that I would be looking for on Palladium. Notice that's red, red, and then green. Um, that looks like uh, this is a price that where it had been exceptional for a long time, and then over the last month, it had sold off sharply, and then the last week, it's continuing to fail. So now what I'm going to do when we look at XME is I'm going to look for where are some logical places that are the, the first places to act as support uh, from its current price levels. And then look at, is there a way to target those um, for a short side trade on a swing basis? And then if I can manage, uh, like if I could get, if I could get short here and manage this much risk, does that give me a two to one potential trade to here or to here or to here? And that way, if it fails, I'm still um, I'm still going in the direction of the trade. So that would be like a continued sell off after an exceptional out period of outperformance. I'm gonna just look at these as ideas, and then I'm gonna wait to see what the uh, the RLCO and the Bollinger Band patterns uh, look like. So that's one of the ways that I look at the monthly re, uh, monthly momentum uh, to find opportunities like that. Um, this is that market health check, and just to to make the case that look, there's there's nothing been going on for 30 days, really even 40 days now. This is just horrible. If this collapses below 215, then it's really, there's only a couple days of movement when it jumped up that high. It comes down to this level here very fast. So if 215 doesn't hold, in my view, this becomes an opportunity for a short-term trade to the downside. I am more likely to get that as an intraday, but even on a swing basis, you can see that's attractive. And then... It gets down here. You see that if we take a look at the bottom of the dragon's belly, it gets down to 205 in a hurry as well. So those 
really two extensions to the downside if 215 fails. So that becomes a market scenario condition for me uh, to frame that trade. Again, if at any time you got any questions on this stuff, you can throw it in the um, in the question or the chat window, and I'll uh, I will get to it. Um, come back to ETF two. We've already sort of looked at this. Um, we've already seen this in another chart. Uh, but the, the strength is in Latin America, and the U.S. is actually, the S&P is actually one of the weaker sectors. So you can see that's money moving away from the U.S. market towards the more speculative ones that are actually working. And then inside the U.S., uh, industrials and technology and materials uh, are the places of strength. Uh, at a glance, I can see that I like uh, Asia uh, much better than Europe and that I love Latin America and emerging markets. Um, still love silver and gold. So any intraday moves that are going in that direction, uh, I look at those as opportunities to get into a swing trade on day one uh, in the direction of the broader market. Uh, now we're looking at ETF2. Uh, what I like to look for are things that are green on strength and white on consistency. So uh, China, there's another China. Both of those are green and white. Um, that looks interesting to me. We'll go with um, FXI because it's 20 times as liquid <coughs> to study uh, to look at China uh, as a newly emerging uh, relative strength leader. Um, this strength and consistency of green and white here among the Dow 30, uh, Cisco, Merck, and Intel all look interesting to me. What makes that even doubly interesting was the fact that on the previous chart we'd seen that um, uh, technology, XLK, was doing well. So the whole tech sector is doing well, and now Intel and Cisco, and even Microsoft, for that matter, are near the top. So I'm going to add Microsoft to that as well. Uh, looking at dailies um, for Tuesday, um, there's no channeling or overreaction signals among the big broad indexes. Uh, when we go out to the ETF 30 and the Dow 30, uh, you'll see we have uh, XLV and United Health. Uh, I notice Merck and Microsoft as triple screens. That really lines up well with that previous uh, look that we made over here about Microsoft and Merck. So that's even more reason to be interested in them. Um, here's a, a, the auto framer on United Health is nice. So. Uh, United Health is certainly going to go on my list.
And we'll take a look at Caterpillar 2 because of the strength in basic materials and industrials. And we'll look at XLV as well. Here's that triple screen there in uh, Merck and Microsoft. United Health at 5.5 to 1. Boeing and Caterpillar. We'll add, let's add Boeing. That was a big winner on Friday with a 1.0 gain. Um, so let's take a look at, um, at Boeing. And uh, we've already seen um, uh, healthcare, metals, and mining were on our list. I'm going to add, I don't know if I put, uh, I put XME back on there. XME because of the uh, uh, number five on the uh, max pain range compression. Uh, on the RLFF, I just want to show uh, the difference between a relative strength leader and a laggard on this one. Is we're going to look at McDonald's in the green here at 10.85 reward to risk ratio. Um, on the green, these are the deep, deep discounted ones, the ones that are the most below their long term value, which is the RL270. This one is almost 11 ATRs below long-term fair value. And then um, uh, we're going to look at Intel and Merck anyway. These are minus 5 and minus 6 ATRs ahead of their RL270. So it's not a surprise to me to see them at the top of the relative strength leaders. That's already telling us uh, what we already know. Uh, but we'll take, take, we'll take a look at this. So we got about a dozen things to look at, uh, time permitting. So let's just go ahead and jump to those uh, charts right now because we actually have quite a few things that we can now look at. All right, so we'll just notice here that um, uh, the S&P is still stuck in that narrow uh, Z3 pinch box here for the last 30 days. Nothing to choose from there. Try to open this up a little bit. Just want to give us a little more real estate here. All right, so let's take a look at gold. Sorry, my screen has locked up a little bit here. Hmm. Let's try it again.
All right, so uh, gold, um, I really like, I like this pattern right here. What I'm seeing is um, the first step where the RL10 has crossed the baby dragon uh, at a Z minus 2 down here. I see the channel, although being uh, tilted downward, I see the channel looks like this. So I see this as the reasonable opportunity to the upside. Um, around 128 would be the target. I would be willing to buy this on strength above the current high um, with a with a stop just below the edge of the river uh, with the idea that I was going to get this trade. So an entry just above here, target one, target two, and maybe even, yeah, that looks like the upside is about 128. But still, there's a nice move from 126 and a half to 128, and that could be a manageable move. Silver is probably going to look similar to that. Yeah, silver has the same look, although silver has been stronger than gold. And so this extra little dip down, which found strong support here at the RL270, that looks like the previous long-term fair value. They were willing to hold that overnight. So I would buy signs of strength, and I'd be looking for uh, 1890, 1940. And then if it gets above 1960 is where I would look to add a second position. So I like that, I like that little uh, breakaway from the long-term gains. On the other hand, if we saw failure in here, and if we saw gold actually acting weak, then I would be looking at symbol Z, S, L for a short-term uh, silver weakness trade since we are below this other cre uh, critical support level. And then I'd be looking at a move uh, down to 1660 uh, based on the, the lower hump of the dragon. So silver, to me, looks like a very interesting play. Um, we'll look at India small caps now. Yep. Uh, India has been a standout in Asia. This is just more of the same. Uh, had a nice breakout on Friday. If we see weakness, your play would be back to let it come back to the Bollinger Band main. But on any additional strength, I think you can get long and keep participating in the macro move uh, in India. Let's take a look back a little further. Let's see. Yeah, this thing is well above previous support levels or resistance levels. Um, so it's free and clear. Uh, strength in India should be rewarded. Uh, China, FXI. You can see how I actually trade China quite a bit. All these are little trade frames. Uh, I like China with a target of about 40. And it's at 38, so you got a $2 move available in there, uh, a 5% move without much effort. And it's already above the dragon's hump. So any sign of strength in China, I'm, uh, I'm willing to buy. Uh, and this has been a pretty strong multi-leg move. And uh, it closed pretty well on Friday. Uh, Cisco, let's look at some individual symbols now. Cisco, you got to love that. It's um, yeah, that's like uh, an eighteen-month high. 
and it's steaming just straight ahead. I think you could just buy that and uh, and trail it. That's a nice, that's a winning position there. Um, Intel. Now the thing on Intel and Cisco, uh, when they were back down here around, when uh, Cisco was down around 28, it was not near the top of the Dow stack. So if you could, we'll see that thing improving um, on a weekly basis by paying attention to the ETF2 report. Um, so Intel is looking like the same. Yep, it's above the 18-month high and steaming northward. Um, I think you got to like that. I'm buying strength. Uh, Merck. Um, that's a that's an interesting one here. You've got this sideways quiet channel. This is probably after an earnings announcement back here, and it's been in the sideways pretty tight channel for 20 days. Uh, but you can see the lows are getting higher, and it closed well on Friday. Uh, I'd be willing to venture uh, uh, on a spec speculative move above Friday's gains because all it has to do is get above 64, and this thing is going to take off because the market will be seen as voting upward. And that's a strong chart after a nice move. And if it can break out above, like I said, if it breaks above Friday's high, I think you can buy it. And then if it breaks above 64, uh, you should be free and clear. Uh, Microsoft. Harder to see the strength in Microsoft than it was in Cisco. Uh, this this is mimicking the pattern of the S&P with that nice bump up. It has been a little stronger on the follow through. It's drifting higher a little faster. Um, so not as much urgency on that one as I think as getting aboard Cisco. United Health. This is like my favorite chart pattern is when you have uh, you already have the value baked into the cake. So this was the previous fair value around 142 up in here and had that sharp move down to what we saw as support before. And now it has some bottoming action. So now as I look at this, uh, I think we're ahead of the curve in uh, in studying this one. I think, you know, um, the RL10 is just about ready to roll up. If this works, the RL10 is going to roll up, and it's aiming for the Bollinger Band mean, and the RL270 is the fair value around 141. And it's trading at 136, so there's about a plus $5 right here of gain. And maybe... Maybe one dollar of risk, so that's what a five to one reward to risk looks like. And by the same token, if this collapses, now you have reason to believe that the next fail could be as big as this fail was, and that fail was from uh, one forty two to one thirty seven. So that's a seven dollars. This thing could go on the downside to one twenty eight, just using the power of symmetry. Okay. So that automatically makes United Health an interesting candidate because you have a strong move in either direction as possible um, and a small amount of risk uh, against that move. Uh, Caterpillar, and we're looking to see strength in Caterpillar just like there was in XLI and XLB, and there has been to a certain extent you almost have that little head fake out of a Z3, Z3 move where you have, you know, five day down and now you have this little one day bounce up and now we're looking for a move to 84. But if it breaks below 81, then I think you can play for this move to here. 
possibly support level here. So you get two, you have two defined support levels that if Caterpillar fails here, you can see target one and target two. Uh, but if it gains here, so that would be our yellow zone right in this area. So if it goes here, you can see that it gets to uh, 84 and a half pretty easily. Then if it gets above 84 and a half, off it goes. So I like that one because it's a it's bi-directional. Um, XLV Healthcare. We've had a nice pullback from this swing high at 76 and then the hump of the dragon around 74 and a half. It has pulled back here to 72 and a half uh, and it's finding support at the RL270. If it fails there, it's going to 69 and a half. So again, you have another case of a trade that frames out well in both directions. If you bought this as a one, this would be a one, two, three entry, and the RL10 would cross the baby dragon, and then somewhere about here, around 73 and a half, you would see that as an RLXD entry, and you'd be looking for 74, 75, and then almost 76. And then failure here would take us down quickly to 69 and a half. So again, you have a critical state in XLV healthcare. Uh, I think that's an attractive trade frame because you're going to get some kind of move. And then I just want you to notice when this thing gets directional, how far it can move and how fast. So in a matter of 10 days, it went from 68 to 75. It, it gave, you know, an 11% move in 10 days just as a sector. Um, let's look at uh, at Boeing. <clears throat> hmm. Not much to choose from here. I I just don't see much much wiggle room. You know, you've got a pretty strong resistance here at 136. Um, there's not enough room really to the downside for this. It's stuck in the middle. Maybe if you're long, this would have to be, this would be about my 15th choice on that one. I don't like that one enough to trade it. Uh, last one, we'll look at metals and mining. So this is one that had given back on a monthly and a weekly basis, like, much like palladium. So, yeah. Um, this, is the, this is an example of something that you really like for swing trading uh, because it has such swingy kinds of moves, like how long it takes these swings to unfold. So Susan asked me about individual stocks. This is why I would... I would go to the ETFs first and look for things that have these long, swingy style moves. And now this one has just started again. There's a, uh, we'd like to have been in this on Friday when it gave us a one, two, three entry, but there's still room in this thing to come up and test the swing high at 29. So you have a nice potential gain. And then if it fails, then we can see it coming back all the way down here to 23. So you have a nice gain available on the downside as well. Okay, so there's about a, there's about a dozen uh, trade frames uh, that will unfold during this week um, that come from just uh, reading some of the broader trends that are available on the weekend report. So hopefully that gives you some more practical ideas about how to find the big trends and then start framing them using our uh, regression line and Bollinger Band framework. So I will have this recorded and uh, forward you the link. So if you want to review these things during the week or see how these trades unfold, then by all means we can do that. 
So uh, if, if if there's no other questions, we're just at an hour, and um, I'll go ahead and call it quits there and uh, wish you guys a safe, uh, safe travels tomorrow if you're traveling for the holiday weekend. Hopefully you're back home safe and sound. Uh, take good care, and I'm going to eat some birthday cake for you. Take good care.